to introduce you to Kabir Khan, the man who last made Ekta Tiger but has made Kabul Express and uh, New York too. Uh, he's done a lot of um, mind-blowing absolutely documentaries, really hard-hitting stuff. Uh, Kabir, you're always known as the outsider who really made it big. So you got to direct Salman Khan and you made the second biggest person <coughs> film. Now, um, for one, do you think you are an outsider? And two, how would you trace the journey of this outsider who was doing all these documentary films, these really hard-hitting documentary films to mainstream cinema? Well, yeah, you know, I really do still uh, think of myself as an outsider. It's been uh, six years now, three films. Um, I've had my sort of share of box office success with them. But somehow I always yeah, tend to place myself outside the Bollywood uh, sort of uh, fraternity as I see it. Because I think it's just the fact that my uh, formative years were spent doing documentaries and based out of Delhi. I was not, I, yeah, I didn't grow up in Bombay, I, I grew up in, in Delhi. And um, I always did feel that I do want to at some point get to the large screen. Uh, but I wasn't really consciously making an effort to go towards it because I was very happy with my documentaries um, because what was happening was that I was fortunate enough to get into the what I call television documentary space. So um, why I'm saying it's different from you know personal documentaries is that um, uh, unfortunately the space for personal documentaries is, is dwindling and, and dead in our country. In no channel today is ready to support documentaries. Today, at least, there is, you know, Discovery and National Geographic. But when I was doing uh, documentaries for them um, 10 years, 15 years uh, ago, uh, not 15, but about 12 years ago, uh, it was very difficult to break into the documentary circuit. So you would make your documentaries and you would probably show them, in a, you know, at India International Center in Delhi or the Habitat Center. And uh, it was, you know, I call it preaching to the converted. Uh, because uh, it was that same set of 2,000 people who would float around between India International Center and Habitat Center and watch those documentaries. So you were speaking to people who were already on the same page as you, you know, as far as uh, issues are concerned or their ideology is concerned. And that became one of the reasons why I started moving away from documentaries towards the large screen. Uh, but before I did the switch, um, I did a lot of uh, very big budget documentaries, uh, especially in Afghanistan. Um, because uh, what had happened was in 1996 is when I was first um, um, contacted by uh, the Red Cross, the International Committee of the Red Cross, and they wanted me to make a film on uh, the effects of war on children. Um, and so I went to Afghanistan for the first time. Now, Afghanistan is a place which I, I had always had a childhood fascination for. I think it's my Pathan roots and, you know, I read this book uh, called Roots by Alex Huxley and I was very fascinated about, you know, going back and tracing my own roots. And since my father was, a, was an academic, we actually did that and traced back some, uh, you know, seven, eight generations to figure out that my ancestors were actually horse thieves who uh, used to steal horses from Afghanistan and bring them down to, to India to sell to the Mughal army and that's how we settled over here. So I was very fascinated. I went to Afghanistan and, um, but I just couldn't complete that documentary because oh. um, seeing the effect of, of you know, 20 years of war on those children was something that, I, you know, one just couldn't put it together as a film. So um, we left. We also left because the Taliban was just 20 kilometers outside Kabul in those days and they were shelling indiscriminately every day. So it became a little too hot to be there. We left thinking we'll probably come back once the Taliban has been pushed back a little. But, you know, as history knows, the Taliban never got pushed back. They came in uh, a month later. Yeah. Uh, and then for the next five years, I couldn't get into Afghanistan because being an Indian, there was no way I was able to get back into uh, Taliban-held Afghanistan. And then when 9-11 happened and uh, we realized that, okay, the Taliban uh, regime is in a way sort of uh, crumbling because of the incessant uh, American um, bombing, I decided, you know, let me go back uh, and see if I can put together something on, um, you know, the five years of the Taliban rule uh, in Afghanistan. And um, that's when I just picked up my camera and my friend Rajan and we went and met one producer, Ramesh Sharma, he was Delhi based. And I said, I want to make a film in Afghanistan. How do we, you know, put together the funds? He picked up the phone. He had some um, international networks who used to, he used to collaborate with and he made this call and he said, I have um, this documentary filmmaker who wants to go back into Afghanistan. And there were so many takers because I think there were not enough mad people ready to go into Afghanistan to make uh, a documentary. There were only sort of journalists and nobody was really going in to make a, you know, a full feature uh, documentary. And within days, we took off. Of course, 
getting in there was uh, you know another very long story which i'll you know narrate maybe in the course of the thing because that's that's how the seed of the idea of kabul express came you know after all these documentaries that i was making these were all international documentaries and they were being you know sent to international networks like nhk of japan canal plus but as a filmmaker i was not interacting with my audience right. so i think for any communicator it's very frustrating when you're making films that you're not being able to see who your audience is or get any feedback from them and that's when i decided that it is you know you need to tell a story in india uh, and you need to reach out it has to be the silver screen and that's when i then uh, wrote my first script which is uh, based on my experiences as a documentary filmmaker in afghanistan and in a way kabul express is a story of what happened with me and my friend uh, in afghanistan and and that's how i started then going in meeting producers so was it easy to convince uh, that your chopra i mean afghanistan chose you obviously uh, your whole experience with it, the fact that yeah. you wanted to face but um, um, aditya chopra how was it to convince him He's um, not, I, 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 I didn't convince Aditya Chopra. That's the story. Uh, so I, I write this, do, uh, you know, uh, script called Kabul Express. It was I put it down in about I would say two to three months. It was easy because it was my, you know, exactly what happened with me. So all I had to do is pen down my experiences and in some way sort of, you know, uh, put it into a coherent uh, storyline. And um, and then I started doing the rounds of of meeting producers and meeting the so-called champions of, you know, alternate cinema. um who i must say are all talk and uh, there's no nobody puts their money where their mouth is especially at least you know 6 years back um so i got a lot of uh, you know they would read my script and they would say you know great script excellent script must do it but nobody was putting their money where their mouth was and um i got all kinds of gyan in this thing that i remember meeting one um, gentleman you know i don't want to take names but um who who sort of heard the story he says great story and um he, so i said you know should i should i narrate it to you so the, the full script he said no no to not today uh monday to thursday you know we listen to proposals and uh, saturday we listen to stories so i said okay so he said so can we discuss your proposal what's your proposal and i was like you know i proposed to make a film like what's the proposal <laughs> so he said uh, no no proposal means um you know what's the cost of your film and uh, what's the recovery plan you know there are 14 distribution territories what's the recovery plan from each territory and what's the star value of the actor you bring? all these kind of things which there's no way a first time filmmaker can ever even imagine or hope to you know know about and i was running like i'm supposed to know all this what's this guy's job <laughs> and um, so anyway i said so what's the slated date for the story uh, since i don't really have much of a proposal and i went on saturday and uh, i narrated the story to him he loved the story uh, but then he said you know um, there are two kinds of films one is a pre friday film and one is a post friday film um, a pre friday film is a film that's made and sold before friday so we get our money back and then you know whatever it does at the box office it does but we've got the investment back a post friday film is a film that has to sort of garner word of mouth and build its own steam and then go on to make uh, money and um, your film seems to be a post friday film um, but our you know the mandate of our company is we don't make post friday films we only make pre friday films so that was the end of that and that's the story that kept getting repeated for about uh, a year almost since i wrote the script uh, i think about 10 11 months later i get a phone call um, saying we calling from yashraj films and aditya chopra wants to speak with you and i was like this is a prank call there's no way aditya chopra is speaking to me because you know aditya chopra is like a ghost people think he doesn't even exist uh, <laughs> let alone get a call from him but i soon realized no this is a serious call and um, so i was given a time i go there uh, i enter yashraj films and i'm led to uh, adi's uh, room and um, open the door he's there and he, he says i've read your script uh, i didn't know this but a friend of mine had uh, knew that Aditya Chopra is looking for scripts which are outside of sort of Yashraj comfort zone uh, so he had given the script of uh, Kabul Express to him and Adi had read it so when i walked in Adi said you know i love your script when can we start and that's it within 3 months i was in Kabul making my first film so so i didn't convince Adi Adi okay. was already convinced when i met him yeah. from the real life world of documentaries to this larger than life world of Salman Khan and Ekta Tiger do you sometimes actually find it difficult to believe you've done it no actually uh, it was in a way a con I, you know when i got the three film contract from yashraj um what a lot of people don't know is that actually there was supposed to be a different division within yashraj and kabul express was the first film of that division 
So which was like a, a, a Fox Searchlight. So okay. the okay. sort of big budget, big, big star films of the Yashraj films and yeah. the small budget, you know, Kabul Express was 4 crores. Not very big stars uh, because I wouldn't want to call John and uh, Ashur <laughs> non-stars but not that big stars at that moment in time. Uh, films. But that division never happened because um, Yashji at that point said doesn't make sense to have a film's a film and you know if Yashraj is changing it's, uh, it's the kind of films that they're making then let them all be under uh, the Yashraj banner. And so when I got the three films I somehow, uh, I wanted to make three very different films in terms of the scale and magnitude and the kind of experience that I would get from them. Right. Uh, and I'm very happy to say that Adi in a way sort of backed that. Uh, so when we did Kabul Express and you know, Kabul Express of course went to a lot of international festivals and you know, it won me the national award and it got you know, what we wanted. And then um, Adi said, you know, do you want to, uh, because you know, he's an apolitical person. So yeah. a, polit a political backdrop to a film doesn't come naturally uh, to him, but somehow he did get excited by that. Because I've, since I was coming from a documentary background and I did a lot of work in international politics, I was always attracted to setting uh, a backdrop. Uh, you know, obviously the film has to be a human story, uh, but setting a very engaging political backdrop uh, to that human story, a backdrop that has a bearing on the, uh, on the story in the foreground. Um, and that's when, uh, you know, he had given me this one line idea for about these three friends. And he said, Ki, isko tum apni dunya mein le jao. Uh, so I said, okay, what does that mean? He said, do you think this will work well against some sort of... And at that point, I was doing research on uh, post 9-11 illegal detentions that had taken place in the, Amer in, in the US. Mm -hmm. And um, I was just thinking about this idea that Adi had given me. And when suddenly I realized that this, actually this story falls beautifully against that backdrop. And that's how mm -hmm. New York happened. Yeah. And New York, I must say, uh, was a big risk at that point in time. You know, post New York, there are a lot of producers who have come to me and said, uh, New York type film banao uh, or, or people wanted to even ask me to make a sequel to New York. I don't understand how because I shot every character in that film. So they're only <laughs> alive to make a sequel. Um, uh, but at that point in time, to make a 20 crore plus film with a very strong political backdrop and that too, politics of not our country, but a so another country, sense. I think, was a risk for Adi to take. Um, and I'm very happy when the film came out, the kind of commercial success that film got was something way beyond our expectations. Because I remember when we were making New York, uh, you know, uh, the marketing guys and all, they would be making like, okay, this is what we need to recover to be safe. And it far exceeded uh, uh, those numbers. So I think then Adi said uh, at one point, um, you know, what do you want to write? And, and I had. Uh, and that's the origin of, of what ultimately became Ekta Tiger. But I had this very fascinating story that I'd heard years ago, uh, again in Afghanistan. It had nothing to do with Afghanistan, but what, what was, was happening was in 2001, uh, October, November, December, when I was in Afghanistan, you know, they were, they were, you were either a journalist in Kabul or you were a spy. There were just so many uh, agents from all over the country because it was a literally a country being reborn, and yeah. there were no bounce, so there were no visas. Everyone was just jumping in. We also came in, just you know, jumped in from Tajikistan, and uh, you know, as the Northern Alliance was was uh, hitting the Taliban and pushing them back, we were going in, and that's how we entered Kabul. Um, so there were so many spies in in that city that they were used to recognize each other and i used to find it bizarre indian guys because and all of them used to access us because we were you know documentary filmmakers and therefore had a lot of access to various remote parts of the country and meeting all kinds of you know we used to meet the warlords before any of them would meet them and um, the indian guys who came say why were you speaking to those guys do you know that he's a he's a pakistani agent and the pakistanis would come and say wo dekho wo aap ka khufia hai so I said, dude, you all know each other. What's this great cloak and dagger game happening over there? And there used to be literally just two uh, places in Kabul, uh, which uh, all you could do is go there, eat your kebabs before 7.30 curfew was called for and you had to run back to wherever you were staying. So everybody used to come to those places because there's no other alternative. Um, at, on one such evening, uh, you know, a, a, a discussion began between sort of people and I, they were talking about somebody, a character and a story which what I found very interesting was both sides know about it, both sides are very cagey about it and not really openly talking about it and that really got me thinking like who can this character be that they're all a little embarrassed about and but both know about 
and that's how I started in a way digging out about uh, a guy who ultimately, I mean, he was, I heard he was codenamed Tiger and that's how I uh, sort of uh, started digging about it and this story was me for, for like some 10 years and uh, at one point I said, listen, I can't get more information and research about this sort of a guy who did whatever he did because no information is coming out of this world. Uh, let me just fill in the blanks and write something. And that's when Adi said, um, you know, this, that idea that you had mentioned, it's a big idea. Do you want to write it, you know, with that scale? I said, yeah. I said, let me. He said, okay, go ahead and write. Don't think of budget, just write a story. So I put together a framework. And that framework obviously looked like a very big film, a big budget film. So then that's, that's when he said, you know, I think we need to bring in a superstar. And then um, I remember him telling me, you know, superstar film has a certain dynamic of its own, which is very different from any other film. Uh, but I was game for it. I said, uh, why not? I mean, it's going to be a great learning experience for me and let's go for it. And that's when I then wrote Ekta Tiger for Salman and um, took it for Salman, took it to Salman. So you never did meet Tiger, the actual Tiger? No, I don't even eventually? know. I don't even know whether that person exists, is okay. dead or alive. And that's why, you know, Tiger ends in that way where yeah. I write that, you know, there have been th sightings and there people yes, say that they're yes. there, but we'll never really know. So it was really about, we don't, don't really know whether something like this happened or did not happen, but I think it's a story worth telling. It just went against the whole jingoistic idea of a hero that we have. So in that sense, you know, today I'm a very relaxed person because of the kind of success that Tiger got. But I was very scared because if you really, really go into the politics of Tiger, they're very subversive politics. I mean, what I'm saying is here's the biggest star our country has portraying this big stud spy of India. He falls in love with the Pakistani girls and leaves his job and runs away because yeah. he thinks love is above all else. And yeah. Uh, it's, you know, I, I, I used to be scared that, um, you know, Shiv Sena would probably lynch me. Uh, but instead of that, uh, Pakistan banned my film and Shiv Sena adopted Ek Tha Tiger and put it on Bala Thap Thakre's <laughs> poster. So, you know, you really don't know how the politics of a film play out. Now, when you uh, make a film with a context, and particularly a political context, uh, don't you think it becomes a little... Um, the Indian audience is not really prepared for that, isn't it? Don't you sometimes feel that you have to hammer at them. I remember you telling us the story about why your film started with explaining to us what RAW was and what ISI was. And so actually it's not the audience, it's I think the, the media more than uh, okay. the thing because that, that came from the media. <laughs> okay. You're right. I mean, uh, there are certain um, uh, things that I would take for granted since I've had an exposure in documentaries and international affairs. So, like if somebody says Syria, I know exactly what's happening in Syria and what the problem is and how is the Syrian problem different from say what's happening in Palestine or Iraq. Um, but if I'm going to make a political, f uh, a mainstream, again the key word is a mainstream political film, then I need to make sure uh, that my audience knows what's happening there. So I, the receptionist at my office, I asked her, I said, do you know Syria? I don't think she knew whether Syria is an apple or a country. So I said, now how am I going to get this girl into my film and mm -hmm. engage her? So there has to be a simple way of being able to put that backdrop. And that's what brings us to the introduction to Tiger. So yes. um, 20 days before uh, the release of the film, and of course the film was a very sort of actually overhyped film. So there's a lot of chatter on, on the uh, networks and channels about it. And I saw a news piece about my film, I won't name the, the news channel, and uh, the voiceover, whoever the reporter was, was said, and uh, something, something, uh, or India ki uh, intelligence agency ISI. And I was like, oh my God, the journalist of this network doesn't know that ISI is not India and I'm going to make a film for a mainstream audience. <laughs> and that's why I said, Adi, I'm taking that, I'm putting it in the, in the front of the film. Clearly, all I want to say is ISI is equal to Pakistan, Roy is equal to India. Now watch the story. You know, so I guess you have to do that. Have to. Um, with Kabul Express, I, fa I faced uh, that issue. But I think in Kabul Express, I was very fortunate. I was able to um, pass the information as you needed it. So yeah. as the, in, the sort of audience needed that information, they got it and it helped them uh, sort of go along with it. But again, as I said, Kabul Express is a niche film. Mm. Uh, it doesn't need the kind of audience Absolutely. that an Ekta Tiger needs. Yeah. See, the, uh, there is no audience in this world which is more diverse and difficult than the Indian audience. I mean, when you, and that's what the lesson I learned when I was making Tiger. I'm catering to 
millionaires in Kulaba who are going to watch it in Inox there and to a person who probably earns 2,000 rupees in Meerut. And mm -hmm. I have to take both of them as my audience and pull them along. Mm -hmm. um, and it's difficult because I am going to do something which is going to piss off that guy in Kulaba. I'm going to do something that's going to alienate that person in Meerut. But I need them both to make what I call a pan-Indian film. Therefore, I guess a little bit of, uh, you know, underlining, overstating uh, is done uh, and has to be done, um, which sometimes pisses off our dear critics, mm -hmm. but they don't understand why you're doing it because that's, that's one of the biggest grouses I have uh, w with the critics of this country. They just, they watch films through one prism, which can't be done. In a country like India, if you're going to uh, watch, uh, you know, a Dhoom 3, uh, through the prism that you are, you know, watching uh, Black Friday, then you are doomed. And yeah. so are the people who are reading your reviews. True, true. Now, you uh, said you went to all these places even before you became a mainstream filmmaker. Yeah. Uh, were there not uh, dangers in doing this and did that not worry you at any point or your family? Uh, how, how did you do that? Was it just a love for travel and do you think that's the way one should do it? Yeah, no, that's uh, like John, John calls me the suicide bomber because uh, I was just, you know, what was, ha I wasn't like consciously going into conflict zones, but uh, yes, most of my travels as a documentary filmmaker was taking me repeatedly to Afghanistan, um, Israel, Bosnia, all these sort of, um, you know, the hell holes of the world when the sort yeah. of trouble is happening over there. And uh, when you enter there, uh, you know, uh, it is scary. There's no way you're going to say that it's not scary. But you know, also what happens is, and I realized, uh, it's like a, um, you, st you start getting desensitized very soon. Okay. And that uh, is, is something that's needed. Otherwise, you'd probably have a nervous breakdown in the first three days in Afghanistan, you know, in the middle of this bombing. But as you progress, and after about three, four days, you slowly start getting desensitized, which is very important because otherwise you can't, uh, proceed with your work but at the same time it can also be very dangerous because it, it can somehow make you do things which you will cross that line yeah. and then yeah. you know a lot of people have paid with their lives uh, and I think the reason why I am in touch I am here talking about my experience is that somehow I think I had that innate sense that okay that much and no further but despite that yes one did get into very dangerous situations um, um, you know got stuck in shootouts I remember once uh, in Afghanistan which is one of the most densely mined countries in the world, um, you, the first lesson you're given in Afghanistan is do not just walk away wherever you want to walk. Like, you know, uh, uh, don't go across from the road or don't go into the fields. But sometimes you forget this. So I was driving from Kabul to Panjshir and it's a beautiful country. And I, this is in winter, uh, February, it was all snow clad mountains. And we stopped for a break. And I remember just getting out of the uh, car and um, you know, just seeing the mountain, then I wanted to take the shot. So now I wanted to go far away because I wanted to sort of compress the highway with the mountains and I needed to do it with my telephoto lens. And I just picked up my camera and I started walking away from the road um, into the field. And I must have walked about 100 meters and suddenly I you know, hear my uh, guide screaming away, you know, and I turn around and he's jumping on the road and he's screaming and I'm trying to figure out what he's saying and he's saying, khatra hai mine. Yeah, and I suddenly realized that I'm in the middle of a minefield, which had not been cleared. It was minus 19 degrees and I was sweating Hindu. I can imagine. But fortunately for me, it was a, it was a deserted field uh, which used to be cultivated. So the mud was loosely packed and I could very clearly see my footprints. Okay. Uh, so I just one by one literally retraced my footsteps and came out. Now this is something that can happen and that's why when I, when I took my crew in 2005-2006 uh, to Kabul uh, to make uh, Kabul Express, that was the first I said, I don't care if your bladder is bursting, you're not going for a pee behind that rock. You know, <laughs> you will tell somebody what you want to do and somebody will guide you. So that does happen. Um, but, but strangely, you know, coming to this, the, the most dangerous situation I've been stuck in despite being in Afghanistan and Iraq and all this is Bihar. Oh. The mo <laughs> uh, closest I came to death. Yeah, yeah. I was that? doing this. Uh, this was very. I just left film school, and I was uh, like a um, like a second cameraman plus fixer for a Channel Four documentary, um, which was um, a, a film that they wanted to make on the gun culture of Bihar, but the nexus between politicians and gangsters in Bihar. 
Uh, and what happened is that they applied to the High Commission uh, in London for uh, <laughs> permission. So the High Commission said, no, there, there are no gangsters in Bihar, so this film doesn't exist. So the poor chaps had to come in and we had to make this undercover. <laughs> so we were there and uh, at that point in time, uh, uh, there were these two gangsters uh, who were in neighboring districts, Purnia and uh, Sehersa. Now, uh, both these gentlemen are members of parliament today and sitting in the parliament. But at that point, there were these mob uh, mobsters there who always used to be fighting. One was a Thakur and one was a Yadav. Um, so we, we approached Papu Yadav uh, and said, we want to film with you. Uh, and, uh, you know, the screws come from England and BBC. So he got, oh my God, I'm, you know, and he wanted to project himself as this, as this political leader. So he said, yes, of course. And he took us, but because he wanted to project himself as a political leader and not a gangster, he told all his gunmen to stay behind. So we go to this village, a uh, remote village. He carries probably three gunmen or four gunmen hidden around so that, you know, he's this Netaji who's come. And we're filming him. And this news reached Anand Mohan Singh's gang, huh. uh, who were always gunning for Papu Yadav. So we go into this, uh, this village, which had just one approach route. It was this mud embankment through these paddy fields, which was wide enough for one car. So we had these five, six cars going in, jeeps and stuff. We went in. We uh, sort of met the villagers there and interviewed this guy about how he's the next rising you know, politician of the state. And unknown to us, while we were there, Anand Mohan Singh had encircled the whole village. And so when we were driving out, um, so, so it was the village, the paddy fields and forests. And the entire forest had been ringed by Anand Mohan Singh. Um, we go halfway into the thing and the first bullet goes through my driver's neck. Like, whoop, and I'm standing behind him. Like, and the car just stops. And suddenly, and it was the, the whole film got changed. The, the film got called Shootout at Sunset. Um, and suddenly, it's twilight, and you're seeing like 50 flashes through the jungles coming, you know? Boop, 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 and something's hitting your car, and everybody just jumped out, went, went uh, sort of uh, under the, the car. I, I had the camera, and I sort of put it on, and uh, you know, uh, put, put it a little ahead of the, of the bonnet. And uh, that, that shootout, like they literally, I remember the, I, was, I was crouching down below the car and my driver was uh, next to me. And a bullet came so close that I literally, I could see my, like yeah. feel my hair being lifted up. And my driver rolled off and fell into the, uh, and I thought he's dead. I thought he's, because it came so close to me, I thought it hit him yeah. in, in the head. But it hadn't, it had just literally gone like a whisker away from him. And we were like that for about 45 minutes till you know the police got to know i to, to this day don't know what stopped them from coming in i think they got to know that we are there and there's a crew there uh, because there were just four gunmen two of them had been killed um, i just don't know why they didn't come in then they were and you i could see gypsies full of people you know driving in and they were jumping off these gypsies with their guns and screaming loudly i think they were screaming to create more fear yeah, um, and uh, but we got out of that that alive so i'm saying so out of all of my experiences, the most dangerous has been back home, in, back home in India, in Bihar. Are you actually a spy now and we don't know about it? It's very funny you ask me this because I, I uh, played this game a lot uh, when I was young to, to sort of uh, make myself, portray myself as a little more exotic and exciting. Um, I used to travel a lot and I used to travel, um, it, there was a period of about four to five years where I must have done about 50 countries in about four years or five right. years uh, doing these documentaries. And uh, since I was doing uh, political documentaries, I used to work very closely with a, with a journalist called uh, Saeed Nakwi. Yes. Who uh, did a lot of international political features. And he was at one point known as uh, the headhunter because, uh, uh, you know, whether it's Nelson Mandela or Gorbachev, their first interview was always Saeed Nakwi. Uh, and I used to travel with him and, and I met all these people with him. Yeah. Um, uh, and I realized that the intelligence services always try and source information from people like Saeed. Okay. So I, and a lot of that I brought into the setup in, in, in Tiger. For I remember, for example, uh, we were in Casablanca and there was a, the summit of the Organization of Islamic Countries. Now, India is not a member of the uh, Organization of the Islamic Countries, but it's a, it, because we have the second largest Muslim population in the world, we are an observer status. Okay. So we allowed access there. And there was a lot of backroom stuff happening, you know, in Casablanca. And um, again, it was full of spies. It was like there are more spies in those kind of <laughs> conferences than diplomats. And it's a line I used in, in Tiger where yeah, yeah. he wants to go to Istanbul and he says, Sir, you know, there are more, you know, agents than, than diplomats in these, in these yeah, kind yeah. of conferences. 
and um, um, so I and they would always come and say, okay, you met these guys. So what were they saying? Um, oh, okay. Why don't we have dinner together and you tell us about you know what that guy speaks? This happened with me a lot in uh, in Afghanistan also when I went in first. Um, we were doing a feature where we actually were interviewing uh, uh, Hamid Karzai and um, the ambassador at that point in time uh, when we landed up. Um, we didn't need his permit because we had lined it up through other quarters. We didn't, weren't going through the government channel. Yeah, it was yeah. supposed to be an independent documentary. So the ambassador had no idea that we were landing up. So when we first landed up, uh, he got a little pissed off. He thought we were bullshitting him. Like, who are these guys who just landed up from nowhere saying, you know, I, I don't get an audience with Hamid Karzai for <laughs> months. And these guys are saying they're going to be interviewing uh, Hamid Karzai. And um, so he was, he, he was very dismissive and he said, okay, you know, like literally bugger off. Um, but we did do that interview. And we finish that interview and reach our hotel back and two black Mercedes from the Indian Embassy come to pick us up. And we say, you know, what does this come for? He said, no, the ambassador wants to meet you. Because once he realized these guys have actually gone and done the interview, he brought us and said, oh, you know, let's have dinner, come for drinks. So th these guys reach out to uh, journalists a lot. And therefore, you know, when I was doing these documentaries, I had a lot of run-ins with, uh, with intelligence agents. Uh, and I used to try and impress a few girls that, you know, the reason why I travel so much is, you really think I'm going there for journalism? No, 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 you know, it's like. You know, um, in India, we tend to look at politics from a very Western viewpoint. There's very little of an Indian viewpoint. Um, why would you say is that so? Is it, like you said, because documentaries don't really have that sort of currency and so we don't no, it's, make it's so Simply because we, we've never had a platform. I mean, today we have uh, NDTV and CNN and IBNs and, you know, people uh, traveling out and reporting international news from an Indian perspective. But when we were growing up, BBC and uh, CNN was it. So you wanted to know anything about what's happening outside the border of India. What BBC said was gospel. So, I mean, yeah, our yeah. entire understanding of international politics came through them, you know, through the sort of uh, Western media. And this, this journalist, uh, Saeed Nakhvi, who I traveled with, the reason why he traveled so much was he was obsessed with this one thing. He said, why do we always understand international politics from a Western point of view? I mean, yeah. there's something happening in Fiji. Um, it might be of interest to, to the British or to the Americans in a, from a certain perspective, but it might be more interesting to us because 50% of the Fiji population is Indian. So yeah. do we not want to know what's happening over there? True. And And that's why we used to travel and that was I must say that now that that was one of the biggest learning experiences for me uh, in my life because um, um, I re and, and uh, what I learned actually is what in some way I'll explain uh, how my three films also fall into. Uh, one of the first documentaries I did with him was in Central Asia and uh, at that point Central Asia uh, you know had these republics which were just coming out of uh, the erstwhile Soviet Union and um, um, there was this bogey that had been created that the Central Asian republics is like there's a huge resurgence of Islamic fundamentalism in uh, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan uh, and and um, how after the Russians are leaving um, you know they're being driven out and the you know jihad there's a call for jihad and, and there was this BBC documentary series called uh, um, some, The Crescent and something, I forget um, what it was. It, and it showed that, it showed, you know, Russian women crying, saying they're being hounded by, you know, the Central Asian people. And uh, you saw those documentaries and you thought, okay, now this is the new center of Islamic fundamentalism. And against that backdrop, we reach uh, Central Asia. Uh, first stop was uh, Tashkent. And we're in Tashkent and... Um, we're trying to find mosques and we can't, can't even find mosques in that city. So, Saeed at one point said, he said, Kabir, um, he used to call me Khan Sahib. He said, Khan Sahib, just get your camera out and let's go out onto the streets. So, we get out on the streets and he starts randomly stopping people and saying, where's the nearest mosque? And people like scratching their head and trying to figure out where the nearest mosque is. Some people not even heard of a mosque. And we're traveling on the streets of this city and this is the city that BBC is portraying as this epicenter of Islamic fundamentalism and nobody even knows where the nearest mosque is. And that was such an eye-opener, that entire trip for me, uh, that there's, so, there's, there's like a certain perspective that the Western media pushes on to us uh, and the ground reality is so different and I found that without fail in almost all of the 60 countries I went to for, for work that there's such a gap between what's told to us and what is the ground reality or what should have been told to us. And 
in that sense, therefore, I say today my films, not only the three that I've made, but even the films that I'm talking about right now, they lie in that gap between what should have been told to us and what oh. was told to us. You know, that sort of no man's land. Right. And on a more personal level, have you ever had to face any problem because of your name? Does, oh, yeah. Does it, yeah? Yeah, yeah. My name is Khan. Actually, it should have been made on should me. Yeah. I've been stopped five times by FBI. Uh, okay. For randomly, why? Because my name is Khan. New York also came about from certain personal experiences. <laughs> I was in the US when 9-11 happened. I was uh, traveling in the US for a month after 9-11. And I saw uh, the state of paranoia that had it had reached there. Uh, once the plane got stopped, uh, I was flying from uh, LA to Washington. This was just when the, uh, the flight started getting resumed uh, after 9-11. And we were stopped on the tarmac for five hours just because of our names, me and there were three others who had Muslim names oh. and uh, uh, one of the passengers, um, he refused to fly. He said, I, I don't want to fly with these people and the FBI had to come in. It was straight out of the movies, you know, you see these dark suited guys coming with wires going into their ears. I was like, wow, this is like first hand experience. And they came up and they took us back to the back of the, uh, the plane and they, they questioned us. They asked us, have you been to, uh, you know, strangely they didn't ask me, have you been to Pakistan, Iran, and sorry, uh, Afghanistan, Iran, which, to which I would have had to say yes. They just asked me, have you been to Pakistan? I've never been to Pakistan. I said, no, I've never been to Pakistan. <laughs> so they said, okay. They took my name and took everybody's name. They did some background search and everything and they came back. And to be fair to them, they, were, they came back and they said, these guys are clear. They told the captain that you can fly. Um, but that guy refused to fly. He said, I'm still not flying. So the captain said, you get off the plane. So he had to get off the plane. His luggage had to be removed. But we were delayed, delayed for five hours. My God. And then, of course, when I applied for a visa to make my film New York, and this is after I've been to the US and filmed in the US at least about six times before that, I go to the, um, um, to the, to the consulate here. And with me are six more people. And in their forms, because we're going for a recce, for a location scout, and um, reason for travel was stated as accompanying director. Everybody gets a visa, I'm rejected. So they're like, we're accompanying like who over here? And, uh, and, and I, at the, I, she said, I, she typed in my name and obviously some sort of you know, red flag started waving in her face <laughs> with my name. And she got a little embarrassed and she said, uh, you know, sir, we'll, you'll have to come back. And she gave me this yellow slip. So I said, but why, what's, what's the problem? And uh, she said, no, you know, it's not, it's not your problem, it's, it's our problem. I said, yeah, but I still want to understand why you would not give me a visa when I've been to your country six times before this. Um, she said, well, you know, your name, your name's very vague. So I said, you know, thank you, I'll tell my mother about that, but uh, what exactly do you mean by vague? And she said, you know, Kabir Khan, there can be so many of them. And I said, but here's a Government of India issued document that says that that Kabir Khan is me. Uh, there are 29 names that are on that list. Any permutation, combination or spelling of that name gets flagged. And then the FBI does a background check and God forbid, like me, if there's some flag that gets raised up in Kabul that yes, he was here, then they have to send somebody to the Kabul station and the Kabul station does a background check. Now, yes, they, they know that I went to Afghanistan to make a film, they know that I went to Afghanistan to do documentaries, but they know, also know that by my own admission, uh, I have met the Taliban. So, the, and this is their thinking. So, what they're saying is that he has met the Taliban and even though he's not, I mean, he's, he, he says he's not a practicing Muslim, uh, he is a Muslim. What if he got compromised? What if he got brainwashed and he's part of a sleeper cell that, you know, wakes up years from now? Now, how do you fight that logic? I could be, I could get active. So, so in their thinking, what if I come to New York to make a film but I end up blowing up of New York? Uh, how do you fight that logic, you mm -hmm. know? And, uh, but anyway, finally I got it and uh, a, a very interesting follow-up happened after that. Um, New York went on to become uh, the most watched film in the Middle East in the pirated, sec in the pirated sector. Okay. Uh, because we release in UAE and, uh, yeah. you know, Kuwait and all these yeah. places, but don't release in Syria, Iraq and all these things. And the Syrian ambassador met uh, the editor of Hindustan Times, Shekhar Gupta, at the airport. And he said, do you know that there's this film called New York, uh, which, is the, which every man, woman and child in, in uh, Syria, Jordan, Iraq has watched. And so Shekhar Gupta did a piece on it. 
and a month later we get an invitation from the Cairo Film Festival to be the opening film for Cairo and this is very strange because uh, you know the, f the opening film of a festival is usually an unreleased film yes. but I go to Cairo and uh, I realize why because I struck a chord with because 90% of the people who went through illegal detentions were Arabs uh, it struck a chord with them uh, and um, uh, of course the, the observation was very interesting they said this is the first film um, that we've watched from anywhere in the world, which talks about uh, jihad and the world of, word of you know, the whole Islamic uh, fundamentalism. But there's not even once in the film do you actually show a man offering namaz or okay. has the word Allah ever been mentioned. Okay. So they found that very uh, you know interesting that you could actually deal with a, yeah. uh, an issue like this without going into that that route. Okay, one last question is: the story goes that you were offered a film when you were in college. Uh, well, what about that? Why didn't you take it? I did, mean, isn't there much more money? Who told you that? Did I tell you that? There are people. We have our sources. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's uh, probably the biggest mistake I made in my life. Because Absolutely. now I realize, I mean, what a lovely life these actors have. You know, directors is all rubbish. Um, this was in. I was in film school in Jamia in Delhi, and um, uh, three years my senior is um, Shah Rukh Khan, and. Um, um, Shah Rukh had just shifted and, and you know when we were in Jamia in those days there was a, we used to like look down upon Bollywood like you know running around you know this running around trees and that kind of stuff so when Shah Rukh made the shift he said Pata nahi kis kisam ki film karega, dekhte kya karta hai. anyway Shah Rukh made a splash so producers and directors suddenly thought that oh there is some film school in Delhi that trains actors and Shah Rukh Khan is from there so they started landing up there and Jamia doesn't train actors. Jamia is um, only about making, you know, about uh, direction and filmmaking. Um, so he went to um, the director of uh, the institute and, and um, Anwar Jamal Kidwai. He was very fond of me uh, for whatever reason and he was a little con confused by when this person came, uh, somebody from the Nadia Dwala family. Um, and uh, they said we want actors. So he said, "Yeah, bhai, actors, achha, wo ek Kabir Khan hai, unse baat kar lo. So he was excited, he bhi Khan hai. Uh, <laughs> so he came to me and, um, and you know, in Jamia, you were only watching Trufo and Godad and Fellini and I really didn't know who the Nadia Dawalas were. I'm working for one of them now, but uh, I didn't know at that point in time. And um, uh, he came to me and he said, um, you know, ha, we're making a film, so come to Bombay. So I was like, very flat. I said, wow, oh really? I said, yeah, this sounds very exciting. He said, yeah, so, you know, I need a new boy. Uh, so when can you come? So I said, uh, I think, uh, you know, next year, September, I'll be free. I would have finished. I was still in first year. So he's like, no, we want you right now. So I said, no, I, you know, I'm in the middle of my course. I need to finish this course. I'm not going to leave my course and come to act. So he got really, I think he got pissed off. Like, this guy is refusing my film. And uh, he said, no, we have to start shooting in 3-4 months. So I said, no, I'm really sorry. I'm pretty clear I want to finish this course. And he started walking away. And uh, I said, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. And that was it. That was, he just turned around and he said, uh, he said his name. And he said, when uh, Bombay come to Bombay, we'll tell someone to ask someone. <laughs> so there went my chance and I ended up becoming a director.